Welcome to our 1 p.m. session in our virtual conference today. Our next speaker is John Malloy, and you are really in for a treat. His topic is exploring the why, making the case for deeper learning. John Malloy is an experienced superintendent of education and former assistant deputy minister who possesses an unwavering belief that all students are able to learn and succeed in supportive learning environments. He leads with a focus to improve student achievement and well being through engagement and access to equitable opportunities. And his vision includes creating and implementing innovative ideas, promoting professional learning, changing system and school culture and practice where necessary, animating caring learning communities, monitoring results, managing resources, engaging families and communities, and ensuring that the system celebrates diversity, responds equitably and is inclusive for every student. Wow, you must be tired, John, that's a lot of work. A collaborative leader, John is a collaborative leader who builds strong relationships and power shared leadership, engages in broad consultation and communicates clear and cohesive direction once decisions have been made. He's a strong advocate for publicly funded education. He builds confidence in the system through a tireless expectation for continuous learning and improvement and by creating conditions for all staff to grow as professionals, leading an exemplary service to students. Uh, you're in for a treat as John shares with you the work that he has done in the past and the work he is currently doing at San Ramon Valley Unified in California. So John, take it away. Thanks so much, Cindy. And I'm just gonna bring my screen up here. Just one second. Okay. We can see it. Okay, perfect. I just want to, excellent. So thank you, Cindy, for that introduction. I apologize that my team sent you the longer one. Um, I am grateful to be here today with all of you. And I'm going to start by making a few comments about um, my sense that you are here today because you are already engaged in this work. You care about this work. You want our students' learning and our students' understanding to be deepened because of the work that we do. And, and that's why in some ways I'm guessing um, that um, the choir is here, if you will. And so as I'm sharing reflections today, I'm gonna be asking you to think about how can we grow deeper learning, problem-based learning across our systems so that we don't simply have lucky classrooms or fortunate schools based upon who might be in them? And so that is the starting point that I wanted to share with you as we begin, because many of us are willing to jump on board because we get a sense of a new idea. We're willing to take some risks. We understand that we are going to make mistakes and we jump in. But as you probably know, a smaller percentage of the education world, as research would suggest it, is willing to do what I just described. There's a whole bunch of educators that are completely willing but just want to wait a little bit to see what happens when those early adopters move forward. There's another group that has to wait and see what the results are from that work before they might be willing to come through that door. And there may be a very small percentage that isn't interested in engaging at all. And we might just have to, said with respect, pull them through the door once we've got ourselves moving forward uh, in a positive way. But I've always felt as a leader in schools, as a leader in districts, that it's our job to communicate the why. Why should we be doing this? And then how do we support each other to do this important work? I just want to tell you a little bit about the district I'm in now. We have 30,000 students. Average attendance rate is high. Graduation rate is solid. Um, we do have all kinds of opportunities for our kids. And the reason why I'm sharing this slide with you is because 
prior to being in the San Ramon Valley, I was the superintendent or director of education in the Toronto District School Board, big urban district in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, 250,000 kids in 600 schools with all of the many and diverse experiences that a big urban board would bring. And now I'm in the San Ramon Valley where our students do really well. We are acknowledged, as this slide suggests, by the state and by our country for all kinds of exemplary work. And I do believe our district is exemplary in many ways. And yet, as I'm going to share today, our new strategic directions just passed by our board a year ago is actually trying to take us in a very significant direction based upon this foundation of academic excellence and achievement. So I wanted you to get a little bit of a sense of where I'm speaking from as you think about your own context. Because when you're thinking about the why for this work, it does need to be explicitly connected to the context that you're working in. So this has become our foundational statement. And as I am sharing with you some of these more district level um, experiences, regardless of where you work and lead in your districts, I'm gonna ask you to think about one question and maybe you can offer some insights in the chat. And that is how from your perspective and the leadership that you provide and in a spirit of shared leadership, we all provide our expertise and experience. How can you help grow deeper learning, problem-based learning across your school and across your district. I'll be speaking from a vantage point regarding how a district does this, but I'll be asking you as we're walking through some of these experiences, what it means for you where you are presently. So it was very important in the San Ramon Valley that we based these strate strategic directions on that foundation of academic excellence that is already present. If we did not do that, I know that I would be challenged, especially by our parent community, who actually moves in many cases to our district because of this foundation. And yet we're holding explicitly to the next statement, which is we're broadening the definition of success. And I think that this is an important starting point for me to share with you because as we heard from AJ before us, how do we define success? What do we see as positive results? What do we think effective outcomes are? Yes, we have standards. Yes, there are expectations, but there is so much more that we need to be providing for our students, which is why this definition of success in my district and I would suggest probably in yours, needs to be broadened. We also are very clearly identifying and, and intentionally choosing the word, our students need to thrive. Thrive means so many things. Thriving means so much more than just reaching a certain grade on a test. It means so much more, even though it may be included, to which post-secondary destination you might attend, the student might attend. Thriving, as I'll speak about in this presentation, is about that whole child, which we've talked about for decades. But when we ask ourselves the question, how much evidence do we have that we're deeply trying to engage the whole child? their well-being, their sense of purpose, their sense of, of, of identity in the school community. And of course, we are committed through our work to innovative and inclusive environments. Again, 
I know that there are really strong reasons why in many cases, school looks like it did decades ago in some classrooms. My guess is not necessarily in the classrooms reflected and represented in this learning session. There are reasons for that. Change is not, as we know, easy. For some reason, we've defined success in such a way that it has motivated things like struggling for a few extra points on a test in order to get a better grade. Now, I'm not negating that that's part of our culture presently for, for pretty solid reasons. But I would suggest that when we are focused so much on that grade in the way it has always been defined, it doesn't actually support the kind of learning that we're talking about. So success in the San Ramon Valley does mean a couple of things. And as I said, achieving academically is certainly a priority. I'm not suggesting otherwise. Experiencing social emotional well being is front and center. In other words, we have to think about how we as educators are supporting our kids or are we causing anxiety? As educators, we need to think about how we're creating safe space in our classrooms and schools or potentially creating dynamics, even if it isn't intended, that makes kids fearful or quiet. I know that we may not be mental health experts. Some of us may have that background. So that's not what I'm speaking about, but really thinking deeply about the environment in our classrooms and schools and how kids feel in it. And the way in which we engage our kids, relate to our kids, provide learning opportunities to our kids has a pro profound effect on social and emotional well being, which is why it's part of our definition of success. Everything we've been hearing so far today speaks to this aspect of success. Our kids being curious, confident, and independent, and I would say as well interdependent as learners. I'm gonna tell you a short story that we experienced during the pandemic. When we needed to go virtual, our educators in the San Ramon Valley Unified School District figured out how to pretty effectively move six hours of face-to-face -face instruction to six hours of on-screen virtual instruction pretty quickly, pretty effectively, but in a way that still reflected our kids' need to have their teacher in the front of the room. For a period of time, we went hybrid. Maybe you did as well, where part of our kids were at home and part of our kids were in school. This is where we learned that our strategic directions needed to focus on the slide you're seeing in front of you right now. Because what we heard from our parents, what we heard from our kids, and what we heard from some of our staff is that they didn't know how to operate unless the teacher was directing the program from the front of the classroom, or the teacher was in this case, digitally, virtually present as if they were in school. And that whole concept of providing some deeper performance tasks, some problem-based learning opportunities, some opportunities for kids to collaborate with one another on the day they were not with their teacher, those strategies struggled. 
And so what we realized pretty quickly is that if our kids are going to be truly effective as they learn in our schools and beyond, we needed to be sure our definition of success included curiosity, confidence, and independence. We can't do anything that is so significant and important, in my opinion, on our own. Yes, we bring our skills and we bring our gifts and we bring our experiences to the learning. But when we do our work alone, and there's a time for that, it is enhanced, it is extended, it is changed by the importance of teams, by the importance of collaboration. And again, we've been speaking about this for decades. And yet, when we look at some of our classrooms, even when the desks in certain classrooms are no longer in rows, but are in groups, I sometimes find that the work that's happening, even in that group, is still pretty individual. Because collaboration doesn't happen by accident. Collaboration needs protocols processes. Collaboration needs us to teach strategies. But we know full well, especially when we look at what the workforce, if that is the motivating factor, which is not certainly the only motivating factor, but something to consider, we know that collaboration, emotional intelligence, is oftentimes at the top of the list. We've been thinking a lot about empathy and compassion, especially as we think about all of the challenges that are happening across our globe, across our nations, in our communities. I know there have been challenging times throughout history, and I'm not suggesting that the time we're in right now is the first time we've experienced such challenges. But as we listen to the adult voices, that are filling so many rooms right now. How well are we able to truly create that space that allows us to listen so deeply to another's experience that we not only try to understand it to the best of our ability, realizing we never can fully do so because we bring each of us our own identities to this discussion, but not only do we try to feel what the others are sharing, but we're willing to try and do something about it. This must be our, an important part of how we define success because we need our kids to become not just leaders in the future, but leaders now. I'm gonna share a quick story that happened in my boardroom just this week. We've been having some challenging conversations around what should be taught in our classrooms and what resources should be used and how we're creating equitable environments and how we're ensuring everyone has a voice and belongs in our classroom and how we deal with implicit bias that might become a barrier for some kids and how we remove some of the obstacles in our systems that keep some kids further away from opportunity. And about eight kids came into our boardroom and shared what they needed from us, the adults, and shared what they were experiencing in our classrooms. And they provided us in that boardroom space, which tends not to be as student friendly, no criticism intended, it's just how it's set up, like I hope your and our classrooms are. But in that space, there was a call to action regarding what we needed to do. Do we believe, no matter what their age, that our students can teach us how to get out of the way sometimes, create the conditions, open the doors 
so that their experience actually drives decision making, next steps, policy, and practice. It is so important that our definition of success includes our students' ability to determine their purpose, understand the importance of giving back, service, getting a sense through their learning that the world, as complex and as amazing as it is, needs them to bring about change, to contribute new ideas, and to make this world, our countries, our communities, better places? And how do the learning opportunities that we engage our kids in allow them to reflect on this very important aspect of success? So many of our kids tell us when they leave our schools and they move into the work world or they go off to college that they sometimes struggle, as I said earlier, without the adult, parent, teacher, other trusted adult, helping them stay on track. So from a very early age, how are we explicitly helping, teaching, supporting our students to achieve goals? To, excuse me, to set those goals and achieve them. I always remember the research from John Hattie many years ago now that says one of the most effective learning strategies is to help students achieve, excuse me, set goals, help them actually exceed those goals, reflect upon how far they've come, which then motivates that much more courageous, adventurous, um, deeper goal setting that keeps that continuous improvement process that we hope for all of us, but most importantly, our, ki our kids to move forward. And success in our definition in the San Ramon Valley has to mean that our kids love learning. And we used the word love on purpose. We use words like engagement, which is fine, and we, we use words like uh, present, they show up, that's great. But I want our students in the San Ramon Valley to experience us in such a way that they have an appetite to keep learning. They have a desire to go deeper. They have the will to tackle the toughest problems that will bring about, I hope, amazing outcomes because we've set the conditions in our classrooms for this to happen. And we've heard this morning that it's not about compliance. It's got to come from that intrinsic place that, in, that drives the work that we're doing. So this is our definition of success. You in your classrooms, or in your schools, or in your districts, I'm trusting have defined what success means as well. This definition is a major driver of the why for deeper learning. And I'm gonna ask you just to think about how do you define success in whatever space you're in? And you might be willing to share some of those insights and perspectives in the chat because this drives the strategic and the change work that we're all a part of. So please feel free to share your insights and perspectives regarding what success means in your space. I'll just take a moment while you have an opportunity to think about that. So within our strategic directions, we now, as our number one driver, have talked about deep learning and innovation. And I'll speak a little bit later why this is our number one driver. And what we're saying is we're creating learning environments that empower students to own their learning, to find purpose, meaning, and joy in their education, 
and excel in post high school endeavors. We know that graduation is not just the, the simple outcome we're striving for. We want our kids to be so capable after they leave us. And this particular goal, high level goal that's in front of you right now, this drives all of our work in the San Ramon Valley Unified School District. Once again, I'm asking you to think about what drives the strategic work in your space. Let me be clear about how we see deeper learning driving the work, because two other components of our strategic plan are equity and social emotional well being. We define equity as ensuring all kids, each and every student, has the conditions to be successful, as I've defined it, has the opportunities to engage in learning experience that takes them there, and it admits, interrupts, and challenges any conditions that might block some students from experiencing the commitment we've made around success. And that means leaning into difficult conversations. It means understanding my own identity, identities, my own bias as it relates to the community. It means potentially engaging, interrupting, and challenging culture that could exist in our schools that don't allow each and every student to be successful. And it may also demand systemic decisions, challenges, and interruption because we all know that systems create culture. Culture influences individual reaction. And some of us have more privilege and voice than others. Some have more access to the opportunities that lead to great outcomes than others. And naming that is an important part of this process. And going back to our data regarding who is successful and who may not is not about the student, it's about our service. That's how we're defining equity. Earlier in this presentation, I provided some definitions for how we are thinking about social emotional well being and how that sense of purpose and that sense of self, that sense of confidence, that ability to develop relationships, to feel connected to have voice is all a part of what we want to provide. But in our definition in the San Ramon Valley Unified School District, and I hope in your classroom schools and districts as well, when we create those opportunities for deeper learning, then research is very clear. Some of the challenges around equity do melt away because we're creating a condition for every voice to matter. We aren't driving success by only one type of assessment and one type of learning task. We're willing to do what we've said for decades we're going to do, which is differentiate what's happening, leaning heavily on student voice, choice, and strengths. And when students and frankly, educators are learning in this kind of deeper learning environment, it is more engaging. We've got data to prove this as well. Kids are happy. They want to be there. And it's better for teachers too. And some of you put in the chat in the last two conversations that you've experienced that. It's just more enjoyable to learn in a space where we start with problems and ideas, we are thinking about design and process. We're allowing kids to take things to where they need to go. We're assessing kids in different ways. We're, pay we're paying attention to their strengths while we're working through the process. It's not one size fits all. You understand this. Who wouldn't want to be in that type of learning environment? And yet, too often, we see other strategies that don't necessarily 
invite voice, that don't often include choice. Yes, we want our kids to fulfill standards, but when that's the driver, we don't necessarily get the kind of energy that we're talking about as we move forward. And I think this is the part we have to accept because you know, in the 30 some years I've been in education, I tell the kids what it was like when I started teaching in, in the late eighties about the tools we didn't have, let alone the computers and such. And I won't go down that road of, you know, the blue ink on our fingers. But the truth is the world is galloping at a pace that we've got to be paying attention to. And we talked about this over and over, and yet we're not keeping up. And when we talk to um, business partners or we talk to civic leaders or we read the research on what, we, what our kids need to be about as they learn and as they move beyond us, it can't simply be, here's the standard, here are the learning tasks, this is the homework assignment, and this is the test. Because if that's all we're doing, we know explicitly that that's not helping our kids get to where they need to be. And that's our job. And we really do need to help as this galloping world continues. And as you know, the challenging problems grow and the adaptive issues that have no easy solutions, we need our kids to be able to move into that space because as we know, they're the leaders of today. And most importantly, they're gonna be the leaders of our very near future. And the polarization that I've talked about where people are finding it difficult to be in the same room with each other, where our media seems to be divided by who believes what, where the whole notion of internet demands a skill that we understand what truth is, that we create spaces where we can really learn and know and understand each other and be willing to shift our perspectives because of it. My, my image is how do we get at least more people into the room even if we can't get them in, uh, at the table. Because the polarization, the outlier views have profound negative implications. We know this, we understand this. And again, deeper learning, problem-based learning, where authentic learning tasks are provided, where kids have the ability to use technology to go beyond their space to think deeply, to design, to collaborate, to think about their sense of self and purpose in relationship to others and beyond. This in my mind is the only way that we can return to what I think is the type of humanity that is required. And some of what we're experiencing now isn't gonna get us there and yet, Deeper learning, I truly believe, provides this opportunity. And this is a question, you can Google this, and the list of 10 most effective skills kids need pretty much come up over and over again in the same way. And I know you'll be hearing um, from Michael Fullen a little bit later. Um, Michael's team, Michael and his team work with us in our district, and I've appreciated him and his team's work for many years. Uh, you may have heard about the six C's. Uh, I, I will speak about a, a, a gentle variation of those that we're using in our district, but that's what the workforce expects. So even when we're dealing with some of our parent community, and let me just go there for a minute, we have the most amazing parents in our district. And our parents really do appreciate some of the traditional ways we provide learning opportunities to our kids. 
And we've got to make the case for this why, the why for deeper learning with them as well. And when we utilize some of this research regarding what the workforce demands, and then we map it to the learning opportunities and learning tasks in our classrooms, then we show how we might be tethered to too much of those more traditional opportunities, testing and such. That's not going to necessarily lead, in fact, I would say it probably won't, to the type of effective skills that our kids need in order to be successful. And I really want to stress what you see here. Yes, being an effective student as we've traditionally defined it is a part of this equation. And what I mean by that is, of course, we want our kids to learn, to feel successful in all the ways I've described. Yes, grades have a place. And yes, post-secondary opportunities are important and we want our kids to thrive there. But, but being an effective student as we may narrowly define it, does not necessarily lead one to be a happy and healthy human being. And when I share this, even with some of our parents who want us to stay the same, this is where the nodding of the heads start. We get this. We know that it's so much more than a narrow definition of being an effective student. And yet, too often, we're still tied there. And that's important for us to break through. And I think this is another key piece that is a part of this equation. And that is, I mean, I'm not that old, but we only had a physical world. You know, when I was growing up, there was no digital world. I mean, you know, I'm in my 50s, but you couldn't even talk on the phone without your mom or dad hearing you because there was only one phone in the kitchen. And again, we've all talked about those examples. We didn't have a digital world. And yet the digital world that our kids are living in, it's here to stay. It's not going anywhere. We talk about social emotional health in the physical world a lot. You may even be using some of the social emotional learning tools that speak to that. I would argue that we haven't been intentional enough about teaching those healthy skills in the digital space where we know all of us, not just our kids, spend a lot of our time. And unfortunately, we even see on the outlier end, new addictions forming, different kinds of bullying happening, and other challenges that emerge when we're not being intentional about this. We've all heard about the pandemic lessons and how it thrust us into something different. But I'm gonna ask a challenging and respectful question. When we look across our classrooms, schools, and districts now, and we think about where we've been, and I don't ever want us to have to go back there again. What have we changed? And how have we changed it systemically? I'm not necessarily talking about just in your classroom or in your school, I'm talking about broadly. And my concern is the notion of getting back to normal means some things that wouldn't necessarily align with what we're talking about today. So in particular, I wanna speak very briefly in my district about how we solidified this why. So we engaged our community widely before we uh, finalized our strategic directions. And we understood the different perspectives that exist in our community. And we use the pandemic to our advantage because I was really amazed at how many people in our community were willing to participate in virtual sessions where we gained their insight. 
We're still using some of those strategies today because of how well they have worked. And when we landed on our strategic directions that you've been hearing me speak about today, it had gone through a collaborative process. Our elected board members were very much a part of it and they approved it. And for any system leaders in the room right now, I would argue that without our board's approval, our work will be challenged. Then we started through a process of thinking about the vi vision or profile of the learner so that our teachers could begin the process of thinking deeply every time they're planning their lesson opportunities, thinking about assessment, thinking about grading, thinking about intervention, whatever it is that you might be thinking about, what is our district's expectation for each and every learner? And then our focus on aligning professional learning at the school level and at the district level so that we can truly implement what we're talking about. And the concept of voice is another foundation to our work. And please note how we're defining shared leadership because many times shared leadership is spoken about but not done. What I mean by that is delegated leadership is very different than shared leadership. Delegated leadership means that I have the authority, I have the position, I come up with an idea and I give it to you to figure out a way to implement. There's nothing wrong with that sometimes, but shared leadership is about, we bring our, in, we bring our expertise and experience together and together we create something new. And I would argue if shared leadership is happening in your space, it's probably happening more with our staff. But you will see by this slide that the type of shared leadership we are driving towards also includes our students and our families. Student voice is a term heard everywhere we go. I've been asking this question in my own district. Where is our student's voice? whose voice might be absent, because if your experience is like mine, we tend to get the students who are in leadership programs on student senates and such. And how are our actions changing because of what we've heard? So I would suggest that deeper learning, problem-based learning, which is a lot about voice, is something that also needs to be broadened because when we're defining shared leadership, we're talking about students in this way. And shared leadership with our families is our model that we create something and we share it with our parents and families for feedback? Or do we actually invite parents and families into the design context? Because who knows their kids best? Just a couple of things to think about. Sometimes when we're trying to bring about transformation, I worry that in the spirit, in the world of education, we sometimes build mountains that are insurmountable to climb. And so in my district right now, we've started a conversation which simply is asking this question. Everywhere we go, Every time a principal's in a discussion, we're saying, let's keep this front of mind. Every time we're at a district table, every time a, a teacher's making a classroom decision, how are we student-centered? Because we use this phrase a lot. And yet, again, said with the greatest amount of respect, I think we're pretty adult-centered in many spaces in education. And so by simply asking the question, the purpose is not to answer it simply or quickly. The purpose is to keep that question front and center so it might invite, it might interrupt, it might challenge, and it might change how we do things. I mentioned that our profile of the learner is very much a connected to the work of New Pedagogies for Deep Learning, uh, Michael Follin and his team. And these are the profile 
terms that we have landed on. This is still very new and probably still in draft because we're asking our schools to engage and think through this, provide us some feedback, and then it'll allow us to move our work forward. But our expectation of every learner in our district are these important components. You've seen variations of this before. The critical thinking, the creative designing, the effective communicating, the insightful collaborating, that sense of global citizen, purpose and service, that empowered learner that understands themselves as a learner, they understand their, their sense of purpose and perseverance and resilience. And because of that, they can do so many things, not just when they're with us, but beyond. So again, we ask this question, how do our students learning experiences, learning opportunities, performance tasks and projects promote this profile? And as you all know, because you're here, deeper learning clearly aligns with all of this. And when we're engaged in deeper learning, we are actually naturally promoting this profile. I think we all would agree that some of the other strategies we use may not take us to this place. So I want to bring my comments uh, to a close with a few process pieces that aren't gonna be the mountaintop again, but might help us think through how to bring about transformation at the classroom level, at the school level, and at the district level, and how the classroom, the school and community, and the district need to be in relationship with one another. There's gotta be reciprocal influence, learning what's happening with kids and teachers and staff members in classrooms that informs direction, directions based upon evidence and research that guides our systemic practice, determining what needs to be coherent across the system and what needs to be responsive and contextual in each classroom and school is complex and important work. So start at the beginning. Where are you right now? Where is your school right now? Where is your district right now? And what does the next step look like? And think about that and reflect on that and start there. Because too often, I believe, when we're trying to bring about transformation, we sometimes tell the polished story of work that's been done for years that might make those who are just starting feel as though they could never reach it. And that in and of itself could cause some motivational challenges. Next step. I have never more inspired, said with every sincerity I can offer, when I throw, when we throw a critical question, a challenging problem into a space where educators can grapple with it when there's no easy answer. No different than the learning opportunities we wanna provide our kids. And yet, how many of our staff meetings, district meetings, reflect the traditional structures we've been talking about relating to students, where somebody stands up in front of the room, shares some things, like I'm doing now, ironically enough, I know that Zoom only allows us to do this, but, um, and then there might be some response or reaction. But if we set up a problem-based learning model for our educators, I have always found that they can get us to a better place because we are so blessed and fortunate with brilliant educators throughout our district. And I'm sure you experience the same. Supporting leaders at every level of the district, and I don't just mean formal leaders, like principals or you know, directors or superintendents or whatever, I'm talking about all of us. 
because we don't get that reciprocal influence without this kind of model for leadership. The early adopters, like many of you, I'm sure, don't necessarily need a map because as we heard from AJ, there's not a manual for this stuff. But there are ways for us to illustrate what we're talking about. And this is where you might come in. If you are already on this journey, how do you invite others in a way that allows them to have their own professional space to understand why you're doing what you're doing, how you're doing what you're doing, and what some of the outcomes are for what you're doing. Because remember, research tells us there's a whole group of people who kind of need to see not just how this works, but what some of the outcomes are. So again, I'm not talking about a manual. I'm simply talking about if we want to bring about transformation, we need to illustrate what this looks like. And that's one of the reasons why in my district, I am grateful that we're working with Defined Learning because they have a deep understanding of how this can be illustrated. Similarly, we're working with um, the deeper learning work, new pedagogies for deep learning, because once again, there's illustrations that aren't all defined, but they give some access points some starting points so that we illustrate where we're going. This entire presentation has been about clarifying the why. If people do not believe that what we're talking about today makes sense, matters, should be happening, you know what? We know how we are. It's not going to happen. We will simply keep holding on to what we already know and what we've already done. I love engaging widely. I'm not afraid of feedback. Resistance teaches us some pretty significant lessons. Ensuring that people with wide experiences, just like our students in class, when we're doing problem-based learning, have the opportunity to share their experience and voice. That engaging widely as part of the transformation process is so very, very important. I can't say this enough. And it's not just listening to students. I should probably add another phrase, but determining with students what our next steps are gonna be. Too often as superintendent, students invite me to a meeting where they want to share with me what they think the district needs to do. That's step one. I'm glad they're advocating. However, we're now shifting that in my district to say, wait a second, you are smart enough to sort this out. You've got the experience to help us do this. Can you please figure this out together and give us your best thinking? Give us the implications for that thinking? You engage widely with your classmates throughout our 36 sites and figure out the direction that we need to head. Because too often as educators, I'll speak for myself, we might have a fix it personality. We hear a problem and we wanna jump in. We wanna solve it fast. And for some problems that can be done. But for the kind of thing we're talking about here, let's let the students do this. And we need supports and tools. And part of that is time. And I know we don't have a lot of time, unfortunately, but that's where we've got to get creative and make it. But we need supports and tools to help us support this important work. And, you know, I find that formal leaders do have a really important role to play because we have to create the conditions that it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to not always see the best results. We saw it in the video that AJ shared about the skateboard. I loved it. We're just going to have to keep falling a few times. And those of us in district positions, we've got to figure out how to navigate public spaces, but that's our job when that quote unquote failing leading to learning happens. But there's the, the, the notion of supports and tools is key. And this 
is so important. Celebrate as often as we can. What's happening as we de define success, how we're seeing it, as we're listening to students, how we're gauging and measuring it. Celebrate often because it goes without saying, celebration motivates the next learning and the next level of work. And my closing comment, everyone is happier in my experience and more engaged. And then of course, truly we've heard it already and you're gonna hear it some more today and more successful as I've, as I've defined success when deep learning is happening. I've really appreciated uh, having this opportunity. Cindy, there may be some questions because there's still a few minutes. Um, this is a passion, I think, of all of us so to bring about this change. So you thank you for the opportunity. Screen. Yes, I. So you're linked in to share your screen. Uh, Mark, okay. Mark, Mark, can you guys turn your sound off? OK, there we go. All right, John, yes, we do have a question. Uh, how do you envision your district moving forward as you're evolving? And how have you responded to the uh, various personalities on your school board? Are they all supportive of deep learning? And how did you get them there? Great question. Let me start with the school board. I find that when we bring, no matter who's on your school board and what their views might be, this is where data speaks. How are kids doing? What needs to shift? In an accessible way, bringing research and evidence to the table especially where there might be gaps, and no matter how successful your district is, there will be gaps. I work to motivate our board members to think about things through the data of what's actually happening in our classrooms. So that's, and I do that publicly, of course, because that's where all of our board meetings are. And, and that is something that I think we as leaders in board spaces have to tell that story in such a way with the evidence that backs it up that makes the rationale for doing this work that much more important. But I'm not gonna be too idealistic. I know that every board is different, every context is different. And some of what we call deep learning, there are some board members across our country in the United States anyway, that may have won an election based upon not necessarily wanting some of this work to happen. So I go back to the data, I tell the story, and I bring about the, the um, hopeful approval. Secondly, in terms of how we're growing this, it's kind of like from every different direction. We've begun what we're calling um, a deeper learning pilot where those schools that want to jump in are, so that they can really engage in this learning. And that's getting us some really critical energy in our earliest days. Others are taking note to say, what's going on there? I would like to consider joining as well. That's one piece. Another piece is we've just invited educators to help us share and learn from their deeper learning innovative practices. So for example, we are having a forum next week where 40 educators are coming to share what they are doing and we are going to capture that in some way. While we're doing that, we are also across 36 sites, never losing sight of our strategic directions, asking key questions like the one, how are we student-centered? And then we are inviting our principals to ensure that this conversation is embodied every opportunity we get. So we've got a couple of things going on on multiple levels. Great, great answer. And another question was, what are the structures you're using to get input from the students and how are you making sure that that's ongoing and iterative? So we are uh, probably on a scale of one to 10, I would suggest we're at about three or four. So I don't want to give you a sense that it's all polished, but where we are starting to see great growth is we're using our traditional structures, I think a bit more creatively. And when I say traditional structures, we have a student board member, we have a student Senate, and we have leadership programs at every school. How do we utilize those already existing structures 
to think more broadly, to think about whose voices are missing, to provide them some support in terms of creating equitable conditions and such, offering them deep learning problem-based tasks as student leaders, that's one thing. Secondly, we're making a shift. How many of your districts invite a couple of students to sit on district committees or school committees? And what we're finding is that doesn't bring out the kind of creative voices we're looking for. So we're shifting to the students get together around, like we have a deep learning and innovation committee. They meet amongst themselves with some facilitation and then a couple of students come to the adult group. We create conditions for their voice so that their voice is front and center. Those are two examples on how we are trying to structure student voice differently in our system. John, your presentation is so exciting and uh, gives us hope for the future and that we have a leader like you who's willing to be courageous and not just comfortable. It's been so wonderful to hear your story and we look forward to seeing where you're going and learning more from you. Um, but I think we have about two minutes till the next presentation. So thank you very much. If we have other questions, we'll get them to you. And if you guys in the chat want to notice, Andy Shaper posted a link to an, an article that uh, John wrote for AASA. And I encourage you to, to uh, download or get that link and get his article. So thanks again, John. It was amazing to have you today. Thanks, Cindy. Thanks to Fine Learning. And I am happy to be here. And please, if anybody asks, I didn't, I should have put it on my presentation. We'll share my presentation, but uh, I'll add my email address to it, get it to you so that you can send it out to everybody who's participating. Does that sound good? That's wonderful. Great. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you.